by Sketch UK here again, something exciting from Stephen Leary. It's a CFMSX2. Now, these parts, I've ordered a lot of these myself, but he has provided some stuff here, which is very kind of him. Uh, so, yeah, it's uh, sent this PCB so you can see it's partly assembled. It's got all of the small components, the chicken feed, you know, the bird seed on there, which is really good because I hate putting those little caps and resistors on. There's still some stuff to go under here, look, just a little bit. Uh, it's probably JLPCB that's assembled that, I bet. I could be wrong. Just because they seem to do one side but not the other. And maybe all the board manufacturers do that, I don't know. But anyway, yeah, lots of stuff on there. Uh, we've got, uh, uh, is that a RAM? ISSI chip there. Yeah, it probably is. Uh, we've got, I think, something in there. I guess that that's the arm. Because I think it's got a little uh, arm chip here for the uh, USB uh, side of stuff here. So what is this? It's a replica MSX. Yeah, I think it supports the MSX2+. Plus. So you've got to install the MSX VDP here, where you've got the Z80, and the YM2149, uh, I think is the one that goes with this, which is the one from the ST, the Tire ST, actually, it's just slightly uprated versus the original one that the MSX would have used, but it's uh, pretty much, comp well, it is compatible, it's backwards compatible, but it has an additional uh, feature there, I forget what it is, or one or two different features, actually. Um, but it should sound exactly the same um, because it's going to be driven. Uh, the, you know, in the, it's not going to use those new features. Is the point I'm trying to make? So what else have we got? Uh, we've got so we've got that chip. He's kindly provided me the uh, DIN here, which is for video, I think. Yeah, that's going to go there, isn't it? Are these nine-pin joystick ports? Perhaps they are. They look like that, don't they? Yeah, the count nine there. So yeah, we can uh, stick some uh, connections there as well. He also provided me the uh, a cart slot here. I might have another one of those, I think. Oh, hang on, no, it's a chip. Hang on, I'm getting confused here. That's the cart slot, yeah. So I've got one of those. It will support two. I'll see if I can get another one of those. So I've got two slots. And then I've all these bits here. So I've got a Z80, uh, 2149F, I think it is. Uh, some RAM, four of those there. Uh, the part number was a bit weird. I'm not sure if these are just like 4164s. The, what I ended up using was from the bomb here is a 61464. So I think it's a bit different actually. But anyway, that should give us, I think, 128k. Um, some of these sockets here. The uh, EEPROM hasn't arrived, so the BIOS stuff is going to be on there, basic or whatever. Uh, so yeah, it's a 27C010, uh, but I've ordered some 27C040s actually, a little switch on the uh, address lines there to have uh, more than the default BIOS, but a socket is a good idea. And I've ordered one of these, but I've not ordered the, the, the 2 Plus model, there's a few different chips you can put here, I've ordered just the, the, the MSX2 chip i could always order another one later but if we socket this up then i could swap that out and it's a good idea anyway just in case there's a problem with what i've ordered it's coming from china they're not cheap they're about 25 30 pounds each those actually yeah so anyway i've got enough to get going with obviously we need a uh, cpld here so mm, that's going to be a problem um oh i've ordered that yeah i have ordered that but again those are coming from china so we'll start on this video by just socketing uh, these things up actually, we'll get the dip sockets on, I'll just go and get my shrink dip, we'll perhaps stick that on first. Uh, yeah, and just checking my spares, I do happen to have one of these left. Uh, yeah, they're really precision engineered these, the pins are so fine, the connections on them are so fine and stuff, so yeah, they can be really hard to get the chips in and out, but it's a really good idea, it's a shrink dip, so the pitch is different here, it's not 2.54, I'll stick it to top left. So yeah, pin one is uh, this side here, so get that into place, and we'll solder that on. I think what I'll do is just anchor everything, and then just solder everything in one long hit. It uh, makes more sense. So it's just a uh, solder up here. So yeah, the MSX was um, a standard that was introduced by Microsoft, I think, and maybe some of the manufacturers. Um, Microsoft wrote the uh, operating system and stuff for it, you know, basic. But it was kind of like a unified design that was agreed upon with different manufacturers and they could, uh, I don't know, pay a license or something to uh, Microsoft the various other places to design their own system based on the, the specs, you know, the specs of the machine, as long as they stayed within their specifications, you'd have a good level of compatibility. Well, ideally 100% level compatibility, and uh, that's why you had different manufacturers ma making the MSX. You had Panasonic, you had Sony, 
Um, I think it's Archie, didn't they do one? There's a few, a uh, number of different manufacturers produced them. Pioneer, I think, did some MSX stuff, didn't they? It was uh, seemingly it was more uh, popular in certain parts of Europe and uh, in Japan. You know, pretty popular in Japan as well. Konami put a lot of their games on this, didn't they, on the MSX? So I'm looking forward to being able to play some of those Konami uh, ports. Anyway, that's uh, that positioned. I mean, technically, we should get that on before we do any of these dip sockets, really. So, mm, yeah, I think I'll do that. I think we'll do that next. It's uh, hang on, I can't get it out. It's stuck down. It's probably got a little bit of flux or something holding it on. Yep, it's stuck in there with flux. It's an arm chip. This, I think. It's going to provide the uh, USB stuff here, so you have a, a USB port here, I think. So I need to get one of those, don't I? Um, and then you connect a USB keyboard, and you've got a keyboard, which is a really good idea. It's really clever. There's a little dot there, so yeah, pin one, top right here. So I'm just going to just wipe the top of that, just gently with some IPA, because I cannot see the surface, because it's been uh, removed with a bit of hot air, and it's got some flux or something on there. Yeah, it's just not very visible. The pin one is in this corner here. It's a bit confusing because if I look at it in light, there's like a round bit there and a round bit there. So unless you can see the print, the print is this way up. You wouldn't know that that's uh, pin one. So yeah, I need to get that lifted up very carefully. And it wants to go that way. Right, I just need to use magnification now, try and get that nicely aligned anchor for your points and drag solder. Well, it's a bit of a speed run, this. Uh, that has been a nightmare to anchor. I've not soldered all the points, just two two points over there. I did have to straighten uh, four or five pins just because it got a little bit bashed in transit. And, uh, yeah, really, really, really fiddly to separate the pins. I had to use, uh, take the blade out of my knife there uh, and try and use that. Um, I must have spent 25 minutes just trying to get that chip straight on all four sides. The main issue, though, is just because it's such a fine pitch on it. Yeah, so I've pretty much anchored everything here. So, one more ram socket. I will just go and uh, check out the bill of materials for this. Try and get the other bits. I think we're going to need a crystal. That looks like a crystal. Uh, I need another slot there. Two ports here. Uh, USB. Some pin headers and things, I think. Uh, you know, for JTAG and for, I don't know, configuration. That's obviously on its way from China. Have we got a crystal there? Maybe the one over here is for the uh, video or something? I don't know. Not sure where the video is coming from, actually, on this. Oh, it might be that. I don't know, one of these. Uh, anyway. Yeah, I'm not sure where the ISSI chip is either. Let's have a look at that. That's looking pretty good so far, isn't it? So I'm still waiting for a number of parts, CPLD, uh, EEPROM, uh, one of the ports here, they're going to mismatch probably, it might look the same actually, the one I've ordered, so it might be the same. Uh, some uh, pin headers still to go on, and I've ordered the dual USB port here, that's why you've got two rows here. Uh, it's going to stand up off the board, so hopefully I've got the right one. The only thing I'm not sure about is this here, this is uh, Q1, looks like a crystal, so I'll ask Stephen about that in a minute. And I've ordered a second port there, so all of those things will arrive throughout this uh, video here, so later we'll revisit and fit those other things. So I won't stick it in the ultrasonic just yet, but what we'll do is just clean up on the underside here, and I think I'm going to get the chips that I do have into the PCB. Uh, now, obviously I need to solder the arm, it's not on yet. That's the only thing that's not been soldered on here, does it? Things stand. So just clean up with the IPA cockpits and toothbrush. So 
So bear in mind, it's going to go through the ultrasonic lighter when the final few components uh, are on there. There might be the odd bit of uh, fluff and dust there at the moment. And there's the odd streak. Yeah, but it will come out like new when uh, they are done. Right, so it's been a day or two uh, since I ordered some extra bits. One or two have arrived. So we've got this isn't going to fit. I literally just went off eye with this. I was like, well, I can see how it's laid out there. Looks on uh, eBay for dual USB uh, port, uh, you know, female. And it, it kind of looks right, doesn't it? It's just a question of will this fit. Hey, it does. Ha <laughs> ha, that was a good guess. So, yeah, credit to Stephen there for... Um, I mean, you could argue it's the wrong part, actually, because it's not... It's not in line here, is it? The correct part Stephen may have used may be in line with the PCB. You know, this is like recess, but you know what? I'm not going to let that bother me. It's not a big deal. The worst case is if this fits in some sort of case, it's just going to protrude a little bit at the back there. As long as you've got a fairly thick case, you know, and you've got a cut out here for that, it isn't going to be uh, an issue. So let's uh, solder that on. So I'm just going to anchor uh, a couple of points, uh, well, one point, I think, just to then just try and position it. Uh, we'll start with one of the anchor points actually. Add some solar there. It's probably floating off the board a bit here at that stage. So I'll press upwards. There, yeah, it was. There you go, it's nice and flat now. And then I'll just uh, inspect it to make sure it's straight. Yeah, that's pretty straight. It just needs like the tiniest little press this way. Just a tiny, tiny bit. So I'll let it get to temperature. Yeah, I think that'll do. Yeah, there we go. I'm pretty comfortable that that is nice and straight. So I'll uh, anchor up here. It's amazing how uh, tidy this board has come out, considering it's not been through the ultrasonic yet, actually. Again, I'm just going to just press upwards a little bit, just to make sure it is flat. And it is. Cleaning up again with cotton buds on IPA. So I'm sure you've gathered by now, I like to uh, try and clean up while I'm going along on this one. Cleaning up again with the toothbrush. There we go, that's not too bad at all. Woohoo, it's really coming along isn't it? So uh, yeah, CPLD, another port I need. ROM and uh, socket VDP. The ROMs have arrived actually, uh, and of course another port. Beyond that, I think just programming up, and then I need to get a 5 volt power source for this. That's a 3.3 volt regulator there for that, I think, and maybe some of the other stuff on there. Um, but yeah, 5 volts, and then the 5 volts is direct to these things here. Uh, and uh, yeah, program up uh, the ROM, program up these two things here. Because this arm, I'm not sure if they explain this arm, it provides the USB side of things for the keyboard and stuff. Yeah, 21.47727 MHz, filming this bit at the end. I just happened to have some of these crystals from when I repaired that batch of Famicoms. It's the exact same frequency. So it may come as a surprise to you that we are on a bench. Uh, if you're uh, on my Patreon, you'll have seen the update videos, the Patreon only. Yeah, um, I needed to do it for many reasons. Um, eventually we got there, so yeah, we've got the uh, the board from the bench here now. I'm not sure if the brightness is going to be good enough, uh, focus and stuff, obviously I'm going to need to experiment. So this is the first bit of footage I have uh, filmed, you know me working on this bench here. Let's get the wrist strap on, solder irons on. So we've got the 9 pin uh, sockets here because we've got the port missing out, so let's get this on, hopefully these will fit. Uh, these are just uh, some cheap ones I ordered from China. So on the new bench here, yeah, the lighting is not ideal. I was just getting used to this environment as well, but it does improve towards the back end of the video. Yeah, you can see the fumes are not really going towards the fan. It's not close enough. Let's just anchor these to two. And I'm just going to just press upwards a little bit. You could say anchor the anchor points. Okay, let's just make sure that's uh, straight. Yeah, that's pretty good actually. So I'll just uh, commit to soldering a bit of many points here. Okay, I'll just press up this a little bit just to make sure it's flat. 
Zoom you a tiny bit there, you can often see a little bit better there now. One problem you can have when you've got lots of solder like that is if you have too much it can sort of flow down here and go crazy but hopefully you can see that's not too bad. Yeah, see this light glare, you need to deal with that, it's a little bit uh, too, uh, what's the word, specular maybe, I need to diffuse the light I think. And then we'll come back when I've got the VDP, program up the chips, um, but also I'm going to need some cars because it's a car only system this at the moment, there's no tape interface, that might be something that uh, happens in a future revision, I don't know. I think the general consensus was, I think um, Stephen spoke to a few people, the bank Joe Guy Ollie was one of them, and he was like, oh well, all the stuff you care about is on cart anyway, um, so don't bother about the tape interface. So yeah, anyway, let's just uh, have a clean. Yeah. So just cleaning up again, you'll notice that I moved the uh, socket there to the other side. Yeah, that was a mistake, a mistake on the Pro so. Sorry, I knocked the camera a bit there as I was trying to get my uh, screwdriver out, just to uh, expedite the removal of this plastic. So much of it is ridiculous. One of the pins is a bit bent there, look. Just straighten that out somewhat. Hopefully, that will go straight on. Yeah, there we go. Let's just get the wrist strap back on. Should have had that on while I was handling that. So, yeah, very nice. I like the uh, idea of having two casts uh, on the end of two cartridges. I'm not sure if all of the MSX's had uh, two carts there, whether that was a standard thing or whether the MSX2 or 2 Plus brought that in, I honestly do not know, I'm not an expert on MSX stuff. Now you could just get a chisel tip on here some flux just drag along here. I'm sure that that's what lots of people would do. Okay, that's one side done. Yeah, that's not so bad. We'll report back in a minute. As I say, just getting used to this workspace here, so. And cleaning up yet again with a cotton bud right here. Yes, you can see here my nails need cut again. That's not bad, but those pins are a bit long, so we need to trim those down. Well, let's just try and snip like that and just sit them down. Anyway, you get the idea, eight and done, all those to go. Right, that's us all trimmed down. Uh, I can show you that uh, in a minute. Uh, so I just want to just uh, toothbrush uh, around there as well. Anyway, you can see that's uh, pretty tidy. And the solder points here trimmed them all down. So mm, yeah, it's about as good as it's going to get, I think. And the next thing to do is to get one of these CPL diesel. So yeah, it's one of these uh, sellers again from China that have just taped them to a piece of card. Let me just have to inspect these. I'm just going to use my little uh, magnifier here. You know, taped to a plastic card. Yeah, it can't be. Good, it's not just cardboard, it's plastic. I will put those in an ESD bag or something in a minute. So anyway, the next thing I have to do is carefully uh, have a look at this. Yeah, some pins on that side there are bent, just from the cardboard. Yeah, you're not going to be able to see it, but the side here, there are a few pins that are a wee bit bent. Yeah, so the part number on this is an XC95288XL. Uh, right, I've got to try and find pin 1 on here now. Looking at this here, I can't see a pin 1 marking, so I'm just going to drop Stephen a message. Bear in mind this is a Proto, uh, you know, the very early 
pro so of this. Yeah, Stephen kindly got back to me. Um, P1 is near the ARM CPU bottom of uh, the board here. So, yeah, this is where it was far, far easier working on carpet. Because when I was in there with natural light, I could just look straight down on this. Now I'm like at an angle because of the chair and the table and stuff. So, yeah, bear with me a minute. It's going to take me a minute or two. What I'm going to do is just try and get it straight and then just uh, add a little bit of solder to one point. I'll show you at that point before we anchor the other side, perhaps. So you're not going to be able to see while I anchor this. Trust me, this is not an easy to work in environment compared to where I was. It's crazy. I, think, I never thought I'd ever say working on the floor was easier than this, but it, it really is. The lighting is the big problem. Oh, except I've just moved it. Oh, God, it's took me ages to align that. Right, I'll be back in a minute. Right, well, this is not going to cause a plan at all. This new working environment is a blooming nightmare. It really is. It was so much easier on the floor. I just can't get angles correctly, can't get the lighting correct. It's like I just can't see what on earth I'm doing, even with magnification. I've now got tons and tons of solder here. I can't seem to move the chip. The braid I was using a minute ago was not absorbing the solder. It's going to sound crazy, but the way I'm going at the moment, I think I'm going to put the board on the ESD mat on the floor. I'm going to do it on the floor just for this bit because I just cannot see well enough or get the right angle. When I'm on the floor, I'm right down on top of it, aren't I? When I'm like this, I'm at a shallow angle of about 30 or 45 degrees or something. Right, this is how crazy things are getting. I'm having to use hot air. Normally, I would not need to use hot air to move this. I have no choice. I cannot move it. Three or four of the pins on the side here are holding it. Despite using the braid there, it's not freed up. So I just need to just heat this corner here and then just move it uh, down towards the DC jack a bit. Well, I guess this is the first time for everything. I have to take it off. I can't adjust it. I can't adjust it in the position it's in. Got a massive piece of braid attached there. Ugh, what is going on? It's the curse of the table, I think. You know, in all the time I worked on the floor, I never experienced problems like this trying to position a chip like that. That has never happened. I may even need to use the hot air now to remove the braid. The, the problem is I've not got you know I've got a shallow angle here. Come on, come on. Stupid braid. There we go. Well, I'll just trim that down before I attach a big giant piece of it again. There we go. Right, I'm now gonna clean around that with a cotton button some IPA and have a second attempt at trying to mail that so I see nice and straight. But anyway I've got some uh, flux all around uh, that I see now. I still don't think it's straight if I'm honest. It's proven it really 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 difficult to try and get that straight. I'm finding it far 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 harder working on this desk. It's so much more light in the other room, and uh, the angle of attack was uh, just made it so much easier. There's some small SMD stuff around here as well, so I'm just going to just, uh, I don't know, just have a slide right there, slide that way a little bit. A lot of this I'm going to have to do on the magnification. Anyway, that's one side sort of done there, I'm not sure you can see that from there. Right, I now need to try and inspect around that. So I know what you're thinking, I'll make it look easy maybe on some earlier videos. This this was a been an SOB. Seriously. I just had to take it off. I was getting ready to uh, I believe it or not, just like pack everything up and start selling everything. So like that. literally that's stressed in this new environment here. Um, yeah, it may come as a surprise to you, but yeah, I just getting really, really cheesed off. And what happened, and it's a consequence of fitting this socket here. Had I never fitted this socket here at this point, 
when I came to fit this CPLD, obviously it would have been far easier. You can see I've melted the edge there, so I need to straighten that. This uh, pin here was uh, bent inwards to the pin next to it, and I tried everything scalpel, all sorts of things pin, needle, multimeter probe because it's pretty darn sharp, the negative, and I couldn't separate them, they were joined. Short, 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 so eventually I had to just take it off and I think I sheared one of the pins off. The pad came a bit loose, I managed to put that back down again and I've just soldered the four pins on that side first and made sure they're all connected and they are, no bridges between them. So, got a new chip on there, but uh, yeah, I don't know where the old one is, it's over here somewhere, I'll give you a macro on it in a minute, it's covered in uh, flux. Got the old chip here, it's covered in flux, but yeah, it's got a pin missing. So, yeah, unfortunate, but... I do not always get everything right, certainly not when the environment is working against me. I just can't see what I'm doing. Anyway, I'll report back in a minute when I've uh, soldered that on. Alright, by some minor miracle, I managed to recover the situation. You know what, I think it's got worse. I think it's got worse because I put the new chip on uh, the board. And uh, it's like, I don't know what it is. It's obviously the packaging that chip came in. All of the chips came in, there's three. It's like the first, uh, I don't know, 12 or 16 pins on here were straight. And the last ones were skewed to the side. On the other side, they were skewed to the side, skewed to the side, you know, etc. All the way around it, I've spent literally hours, about three hours, trying to get that chip on there properly. So anyway, I cleaned up the old chip and uh, using the scalpel, which I don't know what I've done with. Um, I separated the, uh, the pin that was bent, and actually no pins are sheared off it. I've definitely not damaged the PCB, and that chip is on there straight. I've even done some sanity checks. On continuity, just to make sure there's nothing crazy going on in the corners and things. Um, certainly on this uh, corner here, where it was, uh, you know, a bad fit to start with. Why is that bad fit? I'm talking about bridge connections. I mean, to be honest, the chip that I took off, I'd be quite frankly amazed if that chip works. Not just because it had a bent pin but because it got manhandled and heated and heated and heated as I was trying to straighten the blooming pins. Anyway, that's looking pretty clean now, as you can see. So you can't quite see the screen here, but we've got five volts and I've set it to uh, an amp. And I've got the ground connected to the USB ground here. It's um, centre point uh, positive, I think. And if I connect the power here, I know you can't see the meter, but if you watch this LED, so I'm applying 5 volts to the jack here, that LED lights straight away. Now I think this is the arm. The arm is controlling that. Because you'll see it sort of cycles into some flashes and various things, I think. I'm sure it did. No, maybe it didn't. Anyway, it's drawing about 0.6 of an amp. It could, of course, be that this is uh, not of a, a known state, the code on it and stuff at the moment. But uh, anyway, I've measured the re regulator there, 3 volts, it's not 3.3, .3, it's not the, the typical um, pin out either, it must be a different regulator. Um, but anyway, we've got 3 volts on that, uh, that's slightly warm, just like barely. Um, but I would assume that's not going to have a clock on, maybe it is, maybe the clock comes from, from there, from that. So maybe that's got a clock, which is why that's warm. But anyway, we need the ROM, and obviously we need to program this up with JTAG, but now I know the pin out here. I'm just going to solder on my little USB, uh, you know, uh, cable, a two-pin cable, and uh, we'll connect the JTAG up and try and program this chip. And then I'll deal with trying to uh, program the arm. Yeah, there's somewhere down here. Oh, oh my programmer oh, there we go. And the two-pin one and the USB one, so I can uh, power this and program it same time. Yeah, so all I'm going to do here is uh, just confirm the ground again. Two of the contacts on the underside of the, the, this connect here are ground, so I've just checked test from the USB because I know that's a good safe point. Yeah, that is ground. So this outer edge here, so as we flip it up, it's this top one. The lighting's awful in here at the moment anyway, so yeah, we need the studio lighting to arrive. So either of those are ground. Yeah, so what I could do now is use this uh, USB cable here, I think it's an old phone cable, unplug that little pin out of there, stick it onto there the correct way with respect to the colours, 
uh, black to black, red to red. And then that means the PC will power this with 5 volts. So once I've got the power there, I can then stick the JTAG, just wedge it in there. Um, the uh, pinout on this is always the same. It's like TMS, TDO, TDO, TCK, ground, and uh, the VCC, which is 3.3 volts. And I can just literally, uh, I'll check, I've got that the right way, I think I have, just wedge it in at an angle. As long as you've got a sturdy ground, which we have from the, the USB power cable, we should be able to program that up. So uh, let me go and uh, give that a try. I'll be back in a sec. I've shown this before so many times. Just close the file dialog, double click on boundary scan, right click choose initialize chain. Select your .jed file. Then hit program. Uh, just for good measure, I verified it a few times as well. Yes, it's C9F040. Now, I think it only needs a 128K chip. This is 512K, this chip. So what I'm going to need to do is, uh, Stephen kindly sent me the instructions for concatenating the, uh, there's two ROMs. And you concatenate them together in order to get 128K ROM image. So I just need to concatenate the same ROM four times. And then when the upper two address bits on there are just not used, it won't matter. It will just see it as the original 128K chip. So somewhere here, oh there it is, I have an adapter. So I've got a, a chip there that was going to go onto uh, Link's cat. That's going to be another video. The interesting thing is this stuff's been sat like this after I moved into this area. And I'm not sure if you can see, this has moved. This has moved. I'm sure all the stuff was totally straight on here. Somehow, everything just seems to have shifted a tiny little bit. Which is uh, worrying me a little bit. Is the shelf moving? So I didn't show all of the ROM merge and stuff, but basically what you had to do is merge the 32K ROM and the two copies of the 16K ROM twice to create an image that was 128K. And then in this next bit of footage here, you can see me actually uh, concatenating that further, taking the 128K ROM image and concatenating it four times to give a 512K ROM image because I'm using a 27C040. So whilst programming this chip with the uh, TL866, you could see it kept erroring. It went round and round and round. I tried different chip types. I reseated the chip so many times, the adapter so many times, and I was getting nowhere. Eventually I cleaned up the uh, pins on the IC, and that seemed to solve it. Right, as you could probably gather, uh, that from that uh, fast forwarded uh, section there, it took me about I don't know, 25 minutes of messing around with that blooming thing. The issue, um, I am not entirely sure what it was actually, I found that if I reseated the, the chip like that, slid it in the socket and tightened it again, I'd get slightly different behaviour. Sometimes it would erase instantly and go and erase successful, and other times you'd reseat it and say erasing, and the bar would go do 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 and do a blank check and go do 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 and go yeah, it's blank. And then you program it, it'd go uh, a bit, F3 instead of F7 or F8 instead of F4 or something. So I was like, is it a date a bit on here that's bad? So it's like I went through all these chips here, uh, an SST one, the, the two AMD ones, same thing with every single chip, couldn't seem to get anywhere with it. So I then took the chip out of here, I'll show you this, so this one's the one that's programmed up. You can't get uh, an extractor in here, so I'm having to prise a little bit like that. Um, yeah, so I took it out, I used the fiberglass uh, brush on the edges, still didn't make much of a difference, no, that's the programmed one, stick that there. Um, yeah, still didn't uh, make a difference, I'll put all these together actually for the links, because I don't want to stick a copy of Alien on there when it's finished. Apologies, that's a little bit blurred. And the final thing I did is use a pin and actually stick a pin into the edge up there. I just press a little bit and the pin sort of, you, you can see it come outwards a little bit. And I did that all the way around. Put it back in the programmer, exactly uh, the same thing. And then I just uh, undid the uh, the lever on the ZIF socket there, just slid it sideways, tightened it up. Suddenly it worked. So I don't know what the issue was. Was it a combination of things dirty? 
uh, connections on the edge of the thing. These pins did need pushing out a bit, and then maybe dirty connection on these because they're not gold plated. These they're silverish. Maybe what I should have done is uh, just gone up and down this adapter because this adapter has been sat around for blooming ages uh, that way waiting. And obviously you can't get the insides doing that, but anyway, that seems to have uh, worked with that final chip there. So uh, without further ado, let's get the wrist strap on. Should have had that one, I took that chip out a minute ago actually. And uh, let's get that into here. Anyway, uh, the uh, slice is up here. So we just need to align that the same way around and push it in like that. So hopefully we're all good there now. So the only thing we're waiting for is the VDP. As soon as that arrives, we can test it. And in order to program the arm, I uh, fitted this pin header down here. It did take a little bit of, uh, well, magnification. You can see there, ground top right, uh, SWD, I always like to say, SW clock. So you've got a data and clock. Is programmed up. Let's just uh, remove these uh, cables. It's going to take me a while to get used to uh, this uh, camera setup. And as I say, we should get some studio lights uh, any day now, which should make the lighting so much better. Yeah, so that's okay. I need to clean that flux off. But yeah, after programming up, it, that just felt lukewarm, as if it had been powered and programmed successfully. So. Uh, anyway, I can clean up uh, in a minute. Now, I have ordered some cartridge PCBs. I've ordered 20 of those. Right, two months later, I have to order a different chip from a different seller. And that one has arrived. So there it is, a 9938, is that? So I think this is the, uh, it's not the plus one, is it? It's the MSX2. I see, I could be wrong. Um, so, pin one is uh, down here. There's a little bit of dust there, look. Yes it is, and we need to just carefully get that in. The pins are nice and straight on this as well, surprisingly. I'll report back in a few minutes. So before I programmed that, I was just getting a black screen, black screen, black screen, and I assumed I needed to program that, but I spoke to Steve and he was like, no, it doesn't, that doesn't need programming at that point. So there was, you know, there is some issue already. You can see there's a scratch on here now. I might get another one of those actually. And put, <laughs> put one without a scratch. Uh, anyway, it's always handy to have a spare of those. It's on at the moment, switch it off. I'll point you at the screen. There's a lot of light on the screen there, but uh, anyway, hopefully you'll be able to see if it just goes a bit blue because it's intermittent. This I haven't worked out what the cause is. Is it a bad solder point somewhere? I don't think so because once it was on, it stayed on, and then just the power off and power on didn't come back on again. Um, and this is the problem. I'm, Facing here, if I switch it off and on a few times, some ladies you see a blue screen. So we've got a border there, you might just be able to see that it is blue, but it, it hasn't booted, it's like a boot fail. So something somewhere is like being a bit sulky, but when it does boot, it boots perfectly and it comes up with the desktop. You know, I said desktop comes up with basic, and the keyboard works, and you can actually type stuff. I'm like, there's it almost boot again there, look, blue screen. So, yeah, I'm a little bit puzzled as to what the cause is at this stage. It could be specs of one of the components I've used here. Maybe my RAM is dodgy, or maybe the uh, EEPROM is, is behaving differently to the type of EEPROM Stephen's using. Or maybe it's just the version of firmware. I might need to update the firmware again. Again, that's like almost booted. So let me power it off, I'm just going to just press down on the CPLD a little bit here, on one side, just to switch it on. Nope, not that is it. Uh, press down on the pins a little bit and then try it. No, so I, I don't think it's a bad solder point. I don't think we get this behaviour. The three dots there on the AV1 by the way, that indicates this RGB. The video cable for this I got from Cool Novelties. Um, it's a CPC uh, 464 slash 6128 plus. It's the plus one. And if you're anything like me, you may have thought there was no difference. Uh, but yeah, it's look almost booted again. Yeah, but but there is a difference. The um, DIN is different. But it could be uh, like a bad VDP, maybe. That's the uh, an unknown here, isn't it? The VDP I got. Is it definitely a good one? Maybe you should try reseating the VDP. 
Hey, there we go. And this is the thing. Once you get it up like that, you'll see if I press return, it works. Yeah. I need a cartridge, obviously, so I think that'll be the next thing. Let's just try. I'm assuming the basic is very similar to any other basic. If we do send print, uh, I mean, I'm assuming go to is a thing in this basic. Uh, run. There we go. This is the thing. So, why does it work like that now and be stable? Yeah, it took me about, I don't know, 20 or 30 power cycles to get it to boot up. How do you break into that space? Escape. Now, there's probably a key you can press here, combination, but I don't, I'm not familiar with uh, how. There we go. Done some of that. The USB to. Uh, in fact, I've frozen. Oh, no, I haven't. Must have paused it. Yeah, the mapping in terms of what key you press to break into that. Yeah, anyway, let's just try a power cycle and I bet it won't work again. Yeah, look. So I boot fail. So I think possibly... All right. Oh, hang on, then it booted. But then we got this corruption. So I saw this before. I've had this before. If you leave it long enough, it will then boot. But then you get some corruption. So let's just see. Is it a power thing? Do you just need it to leave it a while? Is it normal to get that blue background and then, I don't know, leave it? But... Yeah, same thing, look. Almost consistent. Consistent behaviour. How let Stephen know that? So, I mean, that's interesting. Let's see if we get the same thing this time. No, just a black screen, see? So, yeah, there's definitely some teething problem with um, mine here. So, let's reseat these together. Now, I could use this. I tried to use this on that and it just slipped off. It's like, sometimes, hang on, let's get the strap back on again. You know, it could be a glitch is at 80. Or just a bad connection. This has been sat around for three months or so, waiting for the VDP. So, let's, let's try it now. We've reseated this at 80 just to see if that's uh, any different. And the answer is no. Give it a few power cycles to see if that makes any difference. No, it's just nothing there. I mean, maybe it is about a bad solder point. What well, one way you can sort of prove that if you think, say, for instance, I think it's around the CPLD, put the hot air 150 degrees, heat, 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 just get that chip nice and warm. In fact, let's try that next. Let, let's do that together again. So the power is off, switch the hot air on. Temperature is 127 degrees here, not hot at all. And uh, yeah, let's just warm this uh, chip up here. Because what happens is, a bit of expansion, thermal expansion on the pins there. If you have got just a, a, a marginal solder point somewhere, suddenly you don't you don't have a marginal solder point and then it'll work. Uh, so if that does work, I mean the other thing, <laughs> that, this is another thing right, heating a chip like this, you change the effects, uh, you know, change the impedance. So if there's a design fault in somewhere, or a missing component, a missing cap, some marginal signal, changing the impedance this way with this heat suddenly it may work anyway so you know what it might not reveal a bad solder point but it might reveal something I mean it didn't have a long there did it it was just a, a small amount of heat for a small amount of time nope so it ain't that blooming strange it really is oh hang on yeah it's doing the same thing it's kind of sulky at booting but then it boots and then we get that thing so yeah I don't know I don't think this is going to be a bad connection thing, I think it's just the the firmware maybe. Because what you've got to remember as well is this this board might not be the exact revision that Stephen's working with at the moment, He's, you know, he sent me the latest uh, code for this, and in theory it should behave just the same perhaps as, uh, you know, the, the initial, this initial proto board, but he may have just laid something out a bit differently, his board may have uh, some additional caps in various places, or uh, he may have had to filter something, he might have an inductor or something somewhere that I need to add, etc. So, yeah, anyway, I will just reseat the VDP, just to rule it out. It's working, but uh, just a bit sulky sometimes in terms of booting up. What is interesting, though, is that once it does boot up, it seems solid. Yeah, it, it does seem solid. I have to admit, that's not a, a great fitting socket, actually. So, uh, yeah, I think just for good measure, we'll get the, uh, well, get Mr. Fiberglass pen onto these pins here. 
because uh, you know I didn't do this it came straight from China and it was well packaged this one um, the solder coated but there could just be I don't know some marginal oxidization on one of those there that just means maybe it's not making uh, a good connection as it could do and this is where that impedance thing comes in again like I was talking about with the heat thing you know you get a little bit of uh, resistance from an oxidized connection and the signal might be there but it might be 10% lower than it should be it might be uh, do you see what I mean it can be effective and when you get uh, a signal not as strong as it should be it may just not work so let's try and get that in there we go now it's going in push it in nice clippy sort of fit uh, just checking pin one before I destroy the VDP it's correct uh, nope super sulky you see it could be one of these things that once there's a cart in there it might actually behave really well once there's a bit of loading on some of those lines there that that could be a thing so maybe I shouldn't worry too much about this just now let's even though go 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 and program the cartridge up uh, let's try a game we may find it it's you know it boots nine times out of ten with the game in it yeah I've reseated um, everything there really now so it's not a bad connection I don't think I think what I need on this is a reset button because I found a reset button maybe that would just solve it yeah so it's, it's interesting isn't it how we uh, are able to get into this here where this is like that more often than not but I guess if I press return yeah keyboard's working so right I'll be right back once I've programmed up a game right so here we are back at the uh, bench programmed up the chip uh, we've got here the cartridge from 8-bit uh, manshed banjo guy Ollie the links to his channel down below amazing guy he really is so he allowed me to download the Gerber for this and then uh, ordered a few <laughs> from uh, PCB way. It may have been dirty PCBs actually, I honestly can't remember who he used. Uh, but anyway, let's just uh, get this chip on. There's a position for a, a, obviously a, a decoupling cap here, yeah, bypass cap, and then there's lots of jumpers. And on the silk screen here, he's uh, kindly uh, noted which jumpers you need to set based on which size chip. So this is a 27C 128 that is a wee bit gull wing. Let's just try and bend the pins inwards ever so slightly. And uh, we'll solder that on. There are three or four versions of this actually. I went for the MSX2 uh, version because I'm not sure whether there are different versions. It was in the MSX2 folder. But the question is uh, what are the difference between the different ones in that folder? Because, like I say, there were three or four different versions of this game. And right now I can't get that on. Right, it did take me a minute or two to uh, get that into position. So, yeah, let's, let's just solder that on. I'm not going to put a cap on there just yet, uh, but then obviously we will solder the jumpers and let's just see what happens, I guess. Yeah, so according to the print there, we have three jumpers to set. It looks like JP345, I think. Right, I think it's a case of thou shalt check voltages. The 5 volts is around 4 volts, and I've spent ages trying to work out what on earth is going on. Uh, and it's uh, simpler than you might think. It's actually, I think, the video cable. Let me just show you. If I measure under the board here, if I measure between these two points here, just look at the resistance here. Hang on, if I hold it on there. Uh, 400 ohms. Hang on a minute. The video cable was giving us 33 ohms a minute ago. It's something to do with the video cable, because now the video cable is out here. It's alright, maybe it's my SCAR switcher. Uh, the 5 volts is going straight from the TFMSX, no resistor in between. So this could be something that Steve wants to modern here, but I suspect it might be this cable actually. So on continuity test, if I test from the uh, black wire there, so we're on the black wire, it's the switching pin, and uh, we go to some of the points up here, hang on. Dead short. So it's the top right hand pin there, but more importantly, on the power connector here, zero, zero. So that's five volts. 
yeah so between five volts and ground uh, you can't see the meter but you know we've got 33 ohms we don't now but as soon as this is plugged in we do now the TV is providing the 33 ohms I think but it's because of this it's because there's no resistor coming here for the switching pin it's just like five volts straight in, no resistance so of course the low resistor on the other side is causing a voltage drop I think that's what's going on I think it's pulling the five volts down so I mean just to test that theory um, I'll obviously disconnect this uh, black wire here uh, and there's also a cap across that as well to hold charge on it I guess you know so that it keeps the TV switched into uh, RGB. I think that's pin 16, isn't it? 16, 18, 20. Yes, it is. But nevertheless, I think there needs to be a resistor. You need to limit the current and stuff here. Otherwise, things like that are going to happen. So I'm going to disconnect that black wire. Go and find a super size resistor. Probably somewhat like 330 ohms or something like that. And uh, give it a try that way. Ugh, oh, you know what? My videos are just full of like uh, face palm moments where... Yeah, I learned from my mistakes. Thou shalt check voltages, as I say. Check your power supply. This is a cable I've been using here. I'm getting some voltage drop. I don't know what's happened. I don't know whether it's the crop, one of the crop clips that's hanging on or hanging off, or whether it's these. I just tighten these up. Still a problem. But I've just measured at this point here, four and a half volts. Here on the power supply itself, five volts, as the bench power supply was showing, and that was the thing that was confusing me. The bench power supply is going, vol uh, you know, constant voltage, five point something volts. I'm like, how is the power supply showing at five volts when I've got four and a half volts here? It's blatantly obvious. It's going to be your cables. Anyway, let's just see if we can work out what on earth is going on with this lead. One of these must be good. One of them must be bad. One side. So let's uh, let's clip that onto the black. I just test the black. Zero, zero, zero. So the black's all right. Let's test the red. I hope it's not just an oxidized connection on the power supply or something. Well, there's nothing wrong with it. What, what is going on? I guess the only thing that leaves is this. But you know what? I fail to see how, because that's where I just measured it. I measured it on these points here. So I don't know. I'm getting really, really confused. Right again. Five volts. I don't want five amps, that's for sure. So clips up here. Five volts. So let's now try and clip it to the board. I don't really know. Still don't know. Output off. So this is the five volt here. I need to make sure it doesn't short, so let's just turn that around that way. And I'm just gonna just carefully sort of clip it here, being careful not to try and short anything at all. I don't know if to be happy if this is alright now or not because it will still not make any sense to me so let's measure the uh, cap where I think the 5 volt comes out of 4.3 volts so I don't know what's going on I honestly to god do not know what is going on let me just check the meat uh, let me just check what's coming out of the power supply again maybe the power supply has got a fault yeah we've got 5 volts here so I don't know. Don't know what's going on. I kid you not. I've spent about two hours pissing around with this. These are not even screwed on. There's a the little screw that holds that there, and it's just like it just pushes in there like that and holds it a little bit of uh, goodwill. It's like really, blooming really. No wonder that's not blooming working. Uh, in fact, that's a really thin gauge. Right, I'll show you where I'm at with this. I am getting nowhere fast with it. It's uh, powered on the moment. The first thing is, I had some intermittent problems with this keyboard MCU. It was coming up with like a, a line of uh, screen of listings. I might have a screenshot I can stick up here. Um, yeah, like um, data scrolling up the screen. Uh, and I spoke to Stephen about it, and he was like, I think that's the arm. It's some debug code on the arm. So I don't know what's influencing that, but you can see both power lights here. If I switch this off and on. One of the problems I had with this, and it happened on two different occasions leading up to a few minutes ago. Um, occasionally, one LED would light, the second one wouldn't. And I just press on the board here, power cycle, and then both LEDs would work and let go. Power cycle a few times, and it'd be back to one LED again. The one nearest the USB up here wasn't working. So I reflowed it. That seemed to solve it for a few days while I messed around with this. And then it started again, reflowed it again. That hasn't happened since. So, yeah, there was a bad solder point there. That was creating some problem with the arm but 
I can't work out um, what is going on here. Uh, I've labelled up the uh, ROM. Um, double check that, there's nothing wrong with that ROM, it is the MSX2 Plus ROM, as Stephen instructed me to, there's two, you merge them together, the, the standard BIOS I think, and then an extended BIOS or something, they merge together, it's like I think, the way they're structured in, in this ROM here, it's a 128k chip you're supposed to use, a 27C020, and, um, or a 010 actually I think, isn't it, 128k? Um, yeah, and you have the first BIOS, and then you have the two two copies of the extended one. And then uh, the same again, first BIOS, two copies of the extended one to create 128k ROM image. Now I went with, I think, a 27C020 or an 040, so I, you know, I just doubled or quadrupled that ROM image from that point on. So that isn't the issue there. If the, one of the upper address bits was flowing or driven erratically or whatever, it wouldn't matter because it would always, you know, move into the next block kind of thing. The Z80 I've ruled out. Um, that it does the same with or without, so I don't think that's the problem, and I've ruled out the RAM. Scoped various things, I don't see anything other than some flakiness to the uh, Schmidt's output here, I'll show you that on the scope in a minute. Predominantly, I get a black screen. If I cycle the power, you'll see we've got the three dots here that show the RGB has been detected, so it's output in the video. Um, one in about 20 power cycles, you may get something other than a black screen. So the next thing I've decided to do, and Stephen uh, has uh, agreed, try changing from an MSX2 Plus ROM to straight MSX2. It's not been carts this either, I'll show you, I've built a cart. Yeah, so I've labelled up the other ROM as well. Anyway, right, let's try that, let's power that on. Oh my god, I think it's working. Yeah, it's working. Well, is it going to work every time? Yeah. Ah, I was wondering about this. I watched one of Banjo Gaioli's videos just before I spoke to Stephen about BASIC. Um, and that was one of the things that got me thinking. I thought, I'm sure when he showed it on this channel, this MSX thing came up here with the, the RAM and the VRAM. So it had me wondering, and I know that Banjo Gaioli on his video, there'll be a link down below, he's using a V9938 as well. And... Um, there we go, that's what it is. Do you know, I've spent days messing with this, days. I've scoped so much on it, I've tried so much with that board, I've reflowed the CPLD once, the arm twice. Well, I needed to do the arm, but yeah, I, I've reflowed resistor arrays on it, I've, I've done all sorts, I even did some experiments with hot air, heating up various things, is it temperature layered? Because the behaviour would change over time. Um, but yeah, I'm thrilled to burst, that is brilliant, absolutely fantastic. So I guess the next thing to do is uh, test uh, the cartridge again. So here we are testing uh, a cartridge, I'll show you me building one of these in a minute. Yeah, that's not working is it? This is the thing, so it just either reboots or just gives a blue or black screen. So after speaking to Banjo Gaioli, the guy who created this uh, PCB here from the 8-bit man shed, um, yeah, he was saying that um, on the games I've been trying here, some of these are 32k, um, you've got to swap the blocks around. So you take the, um, you know, split the ROM in two, 32k, 16k, 16k, and swap the order of those blocks around. And then stick it onto uh, a 27C uh, 256, and it should work. So the one I was trying was Nightmare, and uh, yeah, it wouldn't work at all. If we try this now, uh, now this particular one, Banjo Gaioli uh, actually did the bike swap for me. He sent it to me in advance. There we go, that's working. Fantastic. Now I'm not sure about the order of the cart slots here. At the moment it's in the first one. Uh, let's just see, do we have any uh, sound? Right, rebooted that again just to connect a controller. Um, where is the controller gone? Oh, it's over there. Uh, yeah, let's just see if we've got sound. I didn't hear any sound there when that started up. So if it's space. No, there's no sound. So, um, it could be a dodgy YM26, uh, whatever it is, 2145, uh, 21549 is it? It's a 2149F. Yeah, sorry, the part number eluded me there for a minute. So, uh, yeah, I need to speak to Stephen, I think, again. Maybe this, um, the video cable's not wired correctly or something like that, I don't know. It could, could as I say, be faulty chip. Now, I don't think these originally would have had a 2149. I think they would have had a 3 something or other. Uh, I may stick the part top left, I can find it from research. Uh, but this chip is compatible. It's uh, pretty much fully compatible. 
Um, yeah, anyway, that is working, isn't it? Controller works, the graphics look fine. It's a bit flickering, but that is how this game works, you know, in terms of the scrolling. Uh, from what I understand, that was one of the main features of the uh, 2 Plus, you know, when you step up to games that take advantage of the 2 Plus uh, VDP, which I don't have, I've got the 2 VDP, then you get smoother scrolling, I think. There may be other, obviously, you know, features and things that were added as well, can't just be that. Um, but nevertheless, yeah, there's like three different VDPs, you can get the um, original VDP for the MSX thing, and then the MSX2, and the MSX2P, or 2 Plus. Um, and we're in the two at the moment. Yeah, so a million thanks to Stephen Leary. This is incredible. I'm glad I finally got this up and running. Uh, Stephen will tell you, I was uh, messaging him a fair bit about this while I've been looking at this. And it, I'll be honest, it's been going on for about two months, the issues with this, maybe even three months. It's taken an incredible amount of time to get the VDPs and stuff. And it was only after three new VDPs arrived today, which don't work, I'll show you those, um, that, uh, yeah, we, well, I eventually came to the conclusion maybe we should try a different ROM there because maybe that's the issue but yeah the issue with the cartridges yeah i can't thank banjo guy lee enough as i say he's designed this pcb he helped me out with the rom for this one here explained about the uh, the 32k roms how you've got to split the six you know uh, swap the 16k box around it's really cool pcb this has got some jumpers here depending on what size chip you fit on there I'll show you me building one of those in a sec and a couple of points for capacitors there 100 nanofarad and a 100 microfarad so yeah that game works really well thanks ever so much ollie now, because these three VDPs don't work, I have ordered another VDP from AliExpress, a different seller, 100% feedback, and I've ordered a V995, uh, sorry, is it 58? Yeah, 9958. Um, so it will keep this 2 plus ROM, this is a 2 plus BIOS or combined ROM, um, because we can then stick this back in with the new VDP when that arrives and it'll be a 2 plus. So I might show that within this video, it might just be a follow on to this, a short one. Um, bear in mind, I've not got any 2 plus games at the moment. I've, uh, like I said, I've been building one or two cartridges, I'll show you some of that in a minute. But uh, these cartridges, they'll only do small ROMs, you know, like, I don't know, 64K as a maximum, I think. I don't think you can do 128K ones. Um, and then with those larger games, you need additional hardware, you know, like a mapper chip of some sort, an SCC, which is a combined, like, it does some mapping and it provides some uh, custom sound hardware or something, I think. Um, so I don't know whether there's any projects in the works to uh, produce something like that. That would be a cool project, actually, to... You know, create a new cart PCB that supports SCC, you know, maybe on a, an FPGA or something like that. Um, I'm not sure it could be done in a CPLD. It could perhaps be done with a little MCU and a CPLD to uh, glue the thing together, maybe. Anyway, thrilled to bits about that, but I'll show you what is going on with these. I have had to do a separate video to prove to the seller on AliExpress that these don't work, and it's really annoyed me, actually. Um, because trying to upload the thing is hard. So the one we just tested was a V9938. Now look at these, you can see straight away, can you see here? I got some acetone on there and all the black stuff comes off and it's the same on all three of these. There's a patch there where I've rubbed each one. So, yeah, so all three of these have been painted, yeah? And it's evident if you look at the chip side on, you're not gonna be able to see it very well in this light here, but like the bottom is a different shade of black to the top. Chip is in. And you can see the pins all okay. Switch it on. No RGB. No RGB. Switch it off. Switch it on. No RGB. You can see only 700 milliamps drawn. That should be about 8 or 900, almost an amp. There we go. Chip is in. Again, you can see all the pins are good. No LED, 1.2 amps. Ah, ah. Switch power off. So this one is short circuit. Again, you can see pins are okay. On. No LED, 1.265 amps again. That's hot as well. Bad, bad, bad. And the final thing, acetone here, look, fake, um, yeah, would you want to use AliExpress and take a risk with an expensive part like that, uh, if you watch the power LED here now, I'm just checking pin ones right on that, switch it on, and it's booting again, woohoo, so, 
let's uh, let's try some games. Yeah, so I spoke to Stephen about the sound, and he was like, "Did you do the mods I mentioned?" Now I'm sure he didn't. Uh, he thinks he did. Uh, he says you done the mods I mentioned. I look back through WhatsApp. I can't see any unless I've deleted them. Maybe he sent them ages ago. I don't know. Um, two uh, things you do here. I think uh, you short yeah, that cap there. You remove it. So yeah, I removed it and just soldered a blob there, and then you remove this cap here, and uh, apparently that should give us audio. So we'll try Nightmare again here, and we'll just put it in the first slot, should be wearing the wrist strap really. And um, I'll switch the power on, and let's see if we get any sound. Hang on a minute, we didn't even get the game. Yeah, this is something else as well I've noticed, that sometimes it's sulky about booting cars, I don't know why. That, that is a, th a thing that I haven't worked out. I think Banjo Gali may have found that. There we go, that's booted that time. I mean, I, I did reseat it there. Is it a bad connection? I don't know. It's a brand new slot, so let's press space. But hey, we've got sound. That sounds really good as well. Fantastic. So, yeah, if the sound uh, sounds a bit familiar to you, it's because it's the same sound chip as the Atari ST, isn't it, I think? Oh, hang on, there's that flicker there. Yeah, Stephen did, oh, where's the video gone? Stephen did mention uh, one or two, I think Eric in particular had problems with the, the video. Um, that is the first time I've seen a video problem, to be honest. Where it flickered a little bit. Anyway, yeah, that is working with sound, so... Yeah, we'll build uh, a few more carts, I think, and do a bit more testing with uh, more games. So the next one here is Green Beret. Now, I've bite swatched this myself, so uh, yeah, touch wood this works. Well, I said bite swap, banked swapped, you know, let's like, say the lower and... There we go, it's worked. Lower and upper, uh, well, I think it's worked. 8Ks, because I think it's... Um, sorry, not 8K, 16K, I think this is a 32K game. So you get an intro there... Uh, rescue the captives. I'm sure you've all seen Green Beret before. Well, I'm that green guy fighting the green guys at the bottom. I'm dead already. It'd be nice if it was a contrasting colour. He doesn't. Hang on, just missed that bullet. Doesn't. Um, you have to jump to stab those guys, don't you? The green ones. See if we got that. Yeah, it's not bad, it's a wee bit slow. I don't really like the single uh, sprite colour actually, it's a bit conflicting, you know, a bit also a distracting, I guess. And it's a wee bit on the slow side. Oh, those guys are so annoying. Oh, I was trying to go up the ladder. But it will support uh, two, a 7C64, a 128, a 256 or a 512. That's an 82 7C512R. I've got some Winbon ones as well um, to program up some other games. But uh, anyway, let's see how we get on with this one first. Hopefully this will uh, do something other than nothing. So uh, yeah, so pin one is on the right hand side here. I should test this really. Um, I think what I might do later, maybe then after I've done this one, is get a socket onto a board. Uh, that way I can test these chips out before committing to soldering them on. Right, that'll do for the uh, chip. So I've got a Panasonic here actually. The positive is towards the left. I think what I'm going to do is save the legs here. We'll cut these legs off and use these for the jumpers. Three and four are up here, aren't they? Yeah, there we go. So that's the first one. Uh, I'm just going to hold it and solder it. So I will, uh, this is where you need asbestos fingers. You know, heat proof. Ow. Yeah, so that was JP4. Right, that's all three of those jumpers. Uh, just one more cap here, go on, let's fill that as well before we test it. 100 nanofarad. It would work without either of these caps, I'm sure of it. Right, let's give that a go. So we'll get it into the uh, front slot here. The chips do face that way. And 
switch it on. Uh, that's booting okay. But hey! It works. Fantastic. Let's, uh, let's try it in uh, fire. Oh, wow. They've got track and field as well, so I'm uh, yeah, I'm going to stick that on some cartridges. There's three parts to this Hyper Olympics, I think it's, or Hyper Sports. Uh, I'm just going to show what you do here. Well, you don't do that. That was like cannonball. Anyway, I'm very pleased. So, yeah, I'll clean that PCB up and I'll program some more up and show you some more of these games. I've created a few carts here from a series that I absolutely love. Uh, again, I think it's a Konami uh, series, so let's see if this works. I'm not sure what that flickering's all about. Why is it occasionally flickering like that? Yeah, it's not booting again, look. That ain't working. Let me try reseating the cartridge again. I'm wondering if the cartridge slot's just dirty, which is strange for a new cartridge. Oh, cartridge slot. There we go, that's working now. Yeah, track and field. This looks to be an awesome port. Look at that, look at the colours. It looks just like the arcade. Is it fire? Sweet. So yeah, the sounds, uh, it's not bad. It's a bit lacklustre compared to the arcade though, because not even any samples or anything. Yeah, so, wish me luck. This is the point where I break my joystick, hang on. Gotta wait for the go. That was a long wait. Just gotta beat the computer. Yeah, you just beat him, I think. Yep. How cool is that though? What a great port, the colours are fantastic. I always thought this was kind of like a glorified spectrum, but seemingly not. I think it just adds some uh, pretty mediocre spectrum ports just, you know, pushed out to it. A bit uh, too early. Ooh, we're qualified anyway. There we go. I'm a natural at this, but you see I've played this game on so many different systems. It reminds me though of the NES version of this, and I think it's split into multiple cartridges. I went past the line, didn't I? Yeah, so I think there's two cartridges, um, you know, for, for the different events. And it's the same with uh, Hyper Sports. So, uh, yeah, I'm working my way through, programming up all those different uh, games that are in the series here. Because it's a favourite of mine, this. That was a long one. What's next? Hammer throw? I don't think I ever played this. Maybe this was the arcade, I don't know, I probably failed by then. Yeah, I'm not sure what you do there. It's one of those I might have to watch uh, a video on this. Do you even need to swing? No you don't. I don't know what you do. I guess you've got to be fa uh, uh, aiming to the right, so the hammer's got to be on the right, and then you hold down fire, maybe. Let's wait until we don't get right to the end. Hang on. Two, three, four. No, nope. I don't know. Don't know what you do there. I've uh, messed that one up. Anyway, let me keep creating some cartridges, and uh, yeah, I'll report back. So this next one is King's Valley. Um, this one was on recommendation from uh, Banjo Gali. Oh, there we go, it's not working again. This time I've put it in the outer slot though, so I don't know, does that make a difference? Yeah, seemingly. Let me just try reseating it, because this is the thing, I, d I don't know why, but sometimes reseating these makes a big difference. Well, it shouldn't do, because we've got two brand new slots on here. Now I did ultrasonic it previously. Yeah look, you see it's trying to reboot. This is sometimes what it does. And it's given up again. Let's move it to the inner slot. 
it may be some additional capacitance is needed on this board so I might, I might have a go at that I might stick I don't know a 470 or 1000 microfarad somewhere on it yeah it seems a bit sulky with certain cartridges and then sometimes it'll be there you go it'll be it'll recover after that point it's bizarre it doesn't make me think it's a capacitance issue maybe so yeah Kings Valley uh, let's try this space bar Oh, sweet. Yeah, I'll tell you what this uh, reminds me of immediately. It looks like Spelunker. Oh, I'm dead already. And it's a Konami game, this. Gotta love Konami games. So, we've got the steps to collect the treasure. Oh, Mummy won't leave me alone. Can we jump over it? Yeah, we can. He's relentless. Oh, he's left me now, that's all right. Uh, I presume we get that. Oh, we've got a sword. Oh, you can throw it. Hang on. You can't jump, though, when you've got the sword. Oh, you can go up the stairs, though, so that's all right. Hang on a minute. How'd you get out of there, then? Yeah, you can't... Oh, God, that's hard. Anyway, that is definitely my cup of tea. I'm going to get on with that game really uh, well. I think I like that. I just like the charm of it. It does remind me very much of Spelunker though. Alright, so the next one is Track and Field 2. So yeah, they did exactly what happened on the NES and the oh, it might be the Famicom actually, where it was split into two cartridges. Uh, so some of the events are on one cart, some of them on the other. And again, it's been flaky look. So I don't know, maybe a, uh, a CPLD update from Stephen could fix that. So let's bring part one to a close. It was going on quite long and there's uh, still a reasonable amount to show, including hopefully some extras in part two. But the problems towards the back end of this video, we'll resolve those in part two. So a huge thanks to Stephen Leary, Mr. Terrible Fire. He's done an amazing job. I love this little board. It's really, really fun playing these MSX games and there's just so many cool Konami games on it. It's kind of prompted me to maybe even invest in some uh, genuine carts and some flash carts and things like that. So expect some uh, videos on the MSX in future as well. A special thanks to Banjo Guy Ollie for producing the cart PCB. There's more about that in part two as well. And if you didn't see the annotations earlier on, a special thanks to all of my patrons actually for helping the, the move into this new area. You know, I had some amazing donations from all the people that support my channel, but some above and beyond donations from Timo Momo, from Dennis, Retro Game Revival, and from Kavanos as well. And those the donations those guys helped me with as I moved into this area, you know, they funded one or two of the things, like they helped, uh, you know, go towards the cost of the shelving here and some of the drawers and things. Uh, so it just helped things progress. So yeah, I couldn't do this channel without any of you guys and gals. So yeah, massive thanks Stephen. Stephen, you're brilliant. I absolutely love this little system. So I'll catch you in part two. If you'd like to support the channel, please see the coffee and Patreon links. You can join as a YouTube member or you can buy some merch. Uh, have a great Christmas. Part two will be up within a few days. I'll catch you in the next video.